Ah yes, video games. Over the past few decades, they have grown so popular that they are pretty much impossible to avoid now. But don't take my word for it. There are raw numbers that confirm just how huge gaming is these days. In 2020, the global gaming market was valued at $159 billion, making it almost four times as large as the movie industry. Obviously, with that kind of money involved, some companies in the industry have grown to be absolutely massive and successful. However, these huge amounts of cash also come with a few downsides, like attracting organized crime groups who want in on the money. Japan, home to some of the industry's most legendary game developers, is no exception in this regard. In the land of the rising sun, the Yakuza have ruled the criminal underworld for centuries and might even have been involved with your favorite game developer. While there are many Japanese developers that have some sort of history related to the criminal underworld, I want to focus on two companies in particular today, who also happen to be fierce rivals for a while, Nintendo and Sega. And boy do I have some interesting stuff to tell you about these two. Illegal gambling, secret operations, a kidnapping, a smashed arcade machine, and even a shooting. This is the story of Nintendo, Sega, and the Yakuza. I know what you're thinking. Nintendo? What does the world's most family-friendly and innocent gaming company have to do with something as dangerous as the Yakuza? Now, while doing research for this video, I shared exactly the same opinion. What I found was quite interesting though. Nintendo was never run by the Yakuza or anything. Nor do they have any noteworthy connections to the underworld these days. However, there were certain time periods in the company's history where they had no choice but to engage with Japan's underworld. One of those times came at the very beginning of the company itself. To understand the connection between Nintendo and the Yakuza, we also have to learn a little bit about the history of gambling in Japan. It was the year 1549 when Portuguese sailors first brought playing cards to Japan. These Portuguese card decks quickly caught on with the Japanese people and made gambling a huge thing while doing so. Over a hundred years later, in 1663, Japan had entered a self-imposed isolation from the rest of the world, which also brought with it a ban on many foreign goods. This included, of course, Portuguese playing cards and consequently led to a ban on gambling itself. Those who just couldn't get enough of playing cards for money now had to do so in secret, and it would stay that way for around 200 years when a country's isolation finally came to an end. The Meiji government, which brought many western influences back into Japan, also legalized the production and use of playing cards. These were special kinds of cards though, called Hanafuda, which usually had artworks of things like plants and animals on them. They were quite beautiful, like little card-sized paintings. These cards were also a huge business opportunity for many. Among them, a man by the name of Yamauchi Husajiro. He was not only an entrepreneur, he also had a knack for gambling, a passion he could now finally pursue without committing a crime. In 1889, he started his own company, which produced handmade Hanafuda cards for his fellow card players and gamblers. The name of Yamauchi's company carried the name Yamauchi Nintendo. Nintendo started as a company in the city of Kyoto, cultural capital and former actual capital of Japan. In fact, they were still based there and even stayed at the exact same location that the company was founded in until the year 2000. Actually, the location of this headquarters is very important to our story. In the late 19th century, when Nintendo was founded, this area was absolutely packed with Yakuza, particularly the gambling type, also known as Bakuto. To be even more specific, a gang called Aisu Kotetsukai, founded in 1868, was the dominant gang in Kyoto at the time. Interestingly, just like Nintendo, they are still around today. 
Of course, for a card producer, being surrounded by gamblers was not only convenient, but also very profitable. Soon, Yamauchi's Hanafuda cards became hugely popular with the people of Kyoto, including gamblers and criminals. Rumor has it that the Yakuza loved the Nintendo card designs so much that they got them tattooed. Funny to think that Nintendo has been a source of tattoo designs for over a hundred years now. Yamauchi might actually have appreciated the Yakuza as more than just customers though. Rumor has it that the name Nintendo itself is a reference to the criminals. Now, it's important to know that the word Nintendo has always been shrouded in mystery, even among native Japanese speakers and employees of the company. Most frequently, the name is translated as Leaf Luck to Heaven. However, Japanese writing, kanji letters specifically, are incredibly complex and can easily be misinterpreted. This complexity has led to many, many theories over the years as to what Nintendo might actually stand for. Let's take a closer look at the three kanji letters that Nintendo is spelled with. Do is not important in this case. It's simply a letter which was traditionally used to describe a store. Nin and Ten are what we really want to look at. The kanji Ten is also used for the word Tengu, which is a mythical creature from Shinto religion and is usually depicted with an extremely long nose. The nose in Japanese is called Hana which just so happens to be the same word used for flower. Hana is also included in the word Hanafuda, the name of the aforementioned playing cards. In the Osaka and Kyoto regions, where Yamauchi and Nintendo were based, people would rub their nose as a sneaky way of saying, hey, I'm looking for Hanafuda, or gambling games. So what does all of this have to do with Nintendo? Well, when Yamauchi's premium cards weren't doing all that well anymore, he started a new line of more affordable cards under the name Tengu Cards. This name was not chosen without a good reason. For card players, the word Ten generally meant Tengu, and therefore was synonymous with, you guessed it, gambling. As stated before, Yamauchi was an avid gambler and had surely rubbed his nose a few times as well looking for card games in Kyoto. So the letter 10 in Nintendo might have been a hint towards the Yakuza-related Bakuto or gamblers, basically saying, these cards I'm making, I make them for you guys. I don't blame you if you think that all of this is a bit of a reach, but there is an interesting explanation for the Nin letter as well. This time, the explanation comes from none other than the Yakuza themselves. Jake Adelstein, a famous Yakuza reporter and author of the book Tokyo Vice, interviewed two Yakuza members about this whole Nintendo naming situation. Don't worry, their theory is a bit more straightforward. There is a Japanese word called Ninkyo, which could be translated as chivalry. This word is written with the same Nin letter as Nintendo. Now, Nintendo putting this letter into their name is nothing particularly suspicious or anything. However, the word Ninkyo is synonymous with Japan's crime syndicates. The Yakuza traditionally saw themselves as heroes of the common folk, similar to Robin Hood. They see themselves as chivalrous, they see themselves as Ninkyo. Did Nintendo founder Yamauchi possibly show appreciation to his main customer base with his company's name? There is certainly some sort of connection between Nintendo and Yakuza groups during the company's early days, so let me know what you think in the comments. There are two more short stories related to Nintendo and the Yakuza that I thought were interesting. For the first one, we jump forward 70 years to the 1960s. By now, Nintendo had moved into a bigger office and was led by President Yamauchi Hiroshi, the grandson of Nintendo's founder. They had also expanded into other areas, including toys and even the taxi business. They never stopped doing what they got started with as a company though. Even today, you can buy Nintendo produced Hanafuda cards. By the 1960s, these cards were not made by hand anymore. Instead, factories now did all the work. One of Nintendo's card factories hired a young man by the name of Yokoi Gunpei, who would go on to make it big at Nintendo as the producer of the Kid Icarus and Metroid games. His crowning achievement though would of course be the creation of the Game Boy, one of the most influential electronic products of all time. Before changing the world of handheld gaming forever, 
Yokoi would inspect Nintendo's machines for producing Hanafuda cards. These machines had to be regularly inspected for a very particular reason. In an interview, Yokoi recalled, This task was important since these cards were often used for gambling. People from the local mafia would often come to Nintendo, very angry. By then, Nintendo had long left behind any supposed Yakuza ties, that's for sure. Still, it's kind of funny to think that the local Yakuza would regularly swing by a Nintendo factory and yell at the Game Boy creator for losing the money with faulty cards. Our final Nintendo story takes place in November of 1990. By now, Nintendo had been in the video game business for about a decade and had become a household name worldwide. The word Nintendo was now synonymous with video games themselves, and their first home console, the NES, might have saved video games from an untimely death in the 80s. In November of 1990, Nintendo was ready to release their second generation 16-bit console, the SNES, or Super Famicom, in Japan. Based on pre-orders, Nintendo already knew that the system would be a massive success upon its release. However, they also had concerns about the release of the Super Famicom and the involvement of, you guessed it, the Yakuza. The Yakuza, just like Nintendo, were at their peak and were making money from all sorts of ventures. One very profitable business was stealing electronic devices and reselling them for a high price. The Super Famicom, which was difficult to obtain for some due to its massive popularity, could have been a great source of income for the gangs. Nintendo was afraid that the Yakuza would intercept the Super Famicom delivery routes, steal the cargo, and ruin the much-awaited release. As a solution, Nintendo came up with a plan titled Operation Midnight Shipping. The plan was simple, but effective. Instead of delivering the console at regular delivery times, the Super Famicom boxes were secretly loaded onto trucks around midnight when the people of Japan were fast asleep. The delivery routes and times were kept a complete secret. Only a handful of people were informed of the plan in order to make sure that everything went over smoothly. Fast forward to a few hours later and all 300,000 consoles that were pre-ordered had been safely delivered to stores, with no Yakuza member that didn't pre-order the Super Famicom getting their hands on one. Genius. It was also around this time, in the early 1990s, that Nintendo had to deal with some real competition in the video game market for the very first time. The name of their biggest rival at the time, Sega, and their ties to the Yakuza run much deeper than those of Nintendo. Sega having ties to the Japanese Mafia surely makes a lot more sense than it does in Nintendo's case. Their whole marketing approach in the early 90s, when they really started competing with Nintendo, was to seem like an edgier, more rebellious counterpart to Nintendo's family-friendly image. Actually, doesn't this kind of mirror the difference between the rebellious Yakuza and the reserved and calm Japanese citizens? Of course, Sega is also the developer of a video game franchise that revolves around the Yakuza themselves and has caused millions of people worldwide to become interested in the Japanese criminal underworld. I am, of course, talking about the Ryoga Gotoku series, known in the West simply as Yakuza. I honestly expected to find a story about one of the developers being ex-Yakuza or criminals being involved in the development of the game somehow. After all, there is a famous news article where real Yakuza members played the games and stated that they were indeed very accurate depictions of the Yakuza lifestyle. What I found though were two stories in particular that are different from what I expected, but arguably much more interesting. In 2004, Sega became part of a merger with the Sammy Corporation, one of Japan's largest manufacturers of pachinko machines. Pachinko is Japan's favorite gambling game. Imagine it as a sort of mix between a pinball machine and a slot machine. Pachinko is, of course, an incredibly profitable business. 
This profitability mixed with the Yakuza's long time involvement in gambling naturally meant that they wanted in on the money. While over the years, government oversight and regulations have largely pushed the Yakuza away from making it big in the gambling business, there are seemingly still connections with big companies to be found, which became clear just a few years ago. It's the morning of January 8th, 2015. A security guard of a residence in Tokyo's Itabashi area hears a single gunshot being fired. While no one was harmed, he noticed that one of the lights had been shattered by the gunshot. Additionally, the shooter left three unused bullets in front of the residence. The house belonged to none other than Satomi Hajime, the CEO of Sega Sammy. The incident, which seemed like a sort of warning for the chairman, had Yakuza written all over it. So the police started investigating. Two years later, in 2017, a total of three men were arrested as suspects in the case. Two of these three men, who supposedly carried out the crime itself, were not Yakuza members. One of them was an employee at a real estate agency, the other had no occupation stated. The third man, however, who was suspected of hiring the two perpetrators for the job, was Yamamoto Takahiro, a member of the Kobe Yamaguchi Gumi. The Kobe Yamaguchi Gumi was just recently formed at the time, after splitting away from the biggest gang in the history of organized crime in Japan, the Yamaguchi Gumi. Since 2017, no further news have come out about the case, which leads me to believe that Yamamoto and the two men did indeed commit the crime. With Sega Sammy being hugely involved in the pachinko business, and with it gambling, it's not unrealistic to think that Sega is at least somewhat involved with the Yakuza, even now. Now if that last story was a hint at ties between the Yakuza and Sega, then our next story is a full-on confirmation. But there is a catch with this one. It has never been proven, without a doubt, that these claims are actually about Sega. However, at the end of the video, I will present a few details that made me 99% sure that we are, indeed, talking about Sega here. The story itself comes from a book called The Untold History of Japanese Game Developers Volume 2 by John Shipaniak. In the book, the author interviews many people with experience in Japan's gaming industry. Among them was a man who had worked for companies like Square Enix and, of course, Sega. He also asked to be interviewed under a pseudonym and to have certain words and company names redacted for safety reasons. In the book, the man goes by the name Nanashi Hideo. After talking about some unreleased projects that Nanashi worked on, the author of the book asks him about a falling out with a certain company between 1997 and 1998. Out of nowhere, almost casually, Nanashi starts telling a story about a kidnapping that was carried out by said gaming company with the help of the Yakuza. The victim of the kidnapping was none other than Nanashi's younger sister, who had just graduated high school and started attending university at the time. Nanashi had to come up with a plan to rescue his sister, but had to be very careful not to get himself in jail at the same time. He then hired one of his subordinates to get a truck-mounted crane and pick up an arcade machine made by the company in question that Nanashi had acquired in advance. The subordinate took the truck and the arcade machine to the company's headquarters, lifted the arcade up with the crane and dropped it, smashing it into pieces in front of their doorstep. Nanashi then sent a letter to the company saying, One of your employees will be next. As for Nanashi's sister, she was fortunately returned shortly after. Following this wild story, he offers a few more interesting details about the company's leadership. Members of the board of directors, they were involved with the underworld. The buying and selling of game machines itself was mixed up in that world, because that's the kind of business that attracts the Yakuza. Nowadays, they're heavily involved in the pachinko industry. So the old members of the board, they would have short fingers, like the Yakuza would get their fingers cut off. There were really people like that. The author also asked Nanashi if this interview could cause any problems for him. Nanashi replied, I might get murdered by Mostly, the bosses behind Japanese slot machine makers are the South Korean Mafia. And if doesn't kill me, I could lose my livelihood. So make sure this story is an anonymous interview. I think there are many people in the Japanese games industry who strongly want to talk, but cannot show their name. There are many dark stories. 
Now, I would like to talk about why I and many people online think that this might be Sega. You may have noticed that the book did not use random amounts of X's to redact names. The company itself is always hidden by exactly four X's. When talking about the kidnapping story, Nanashi also mentioned that he is talking about a big company and their motive for the kidnapping was to stop him from associating with Nintendo. There are not that many big Japanese companies that were in fierce competition with Nintendo. Only Sony and Sega spring to mind. While Sony would certainly fit the four axes, Nanashi also mentions that the company is now heavily involved in the pachinko industry. As far as I know, Sony is not in the pachinko business at all. Another hint comes from Nanashi talking about the location of the company's headquarters. I just smashed it in front of their main office in the middle of the night. It was easy. The headquarters are in now, but back then they were near airport. Their office building was right in front of a major street, in a commercial district without any residential homes. The X's hiding the current location perfectly fit the word Shinagawa, an area of Tokyo that Sega currently calls its home. The airport that Nanashi mentions could be Haneda Airport, near Otori in Tokyo, where Sega had its headquarters until 2018. Nanashi at one point also told the author of the book about the so-called Kakuri Beya, which were used by the company. If you search for and Kakuri Beya in Japanese, you can find many articles like this. At the end of the 90s, Sega ended up in multiple newspapers across Japan for the use of isolation rooms or Kakuri Beya. Basically, these were windowless rooms with nothing inside. Around the turn of the new millennium, Sega started struggling financially and wanted to cut down on their workforce. They would allegedly put unwanted workers into these isolation rooms with nothing to do, where they would stay until they quit their job. It's important to mention though that Sega was not the only Japanese company who utilized this cruel tactic when trying to push out employees. According to many reports, the use of Kakuri Beya is unfortunately fairly widespread in Japan. So what do you think? Is the company in question actually Sega? Or is there another solution to the puzzle? Let me know in the comments and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. As always, thank you so much for watching. Sayonara.